that actually. Welcome to Smarter Markets, a free weekly podcast featuring stories from the entrepreneurs and icons of commodities, capital markets, and technology, ranting on the inadequacies of our systems and riffing on ideas for how to solve them. Together, we explore the questions: Is capitalism in crisis? And will building smarter markets be the antidote? And now, the Smarter Market. Welcome to the second season of Smarter Markets, a weekly podcast that explores how financial and technology markets can be redesigned and improved to better serve market participants and society as a whole. Smarter Markets is brought to you by ABAX Technologies, and I'm Michelle Dennedy, the former Chief Privacy Officer of Cisco and Intel Security, CEO of a stealthy privacy company and partner at Pravatis. I'll be one of the new hosts this season as we expand our conversations into the great energy and digital transitions. My guest for the opening episode of our second season is none other than Jim Whitehurst, the president of IBM and former chief executive officer of Red Hat. Jim is responsible for the IBM cloud and cognitive software organization, corporate strategy, and is an advocate for open principles as a catalyst for business innovation. With a background in business development, finance, and global operations, he has proven expertise helping companies flourish, even in the most challenging environments. At Red Hat, Whitehurst grew its influence with key milestones, including becoming the first 1 billion revenue open source software company in 2012, and most notably, the landmark acquisition of Red Hat by IBM for $34 billion in 2019. My interview with Jim Whitehurst is coming up next. And now, back to this week's episode of Smarter Markets. All right. So, you know, we're we're going to talk about the future of IBM and where you're going to drive us. And that's, you know, smarter markets. We're going to talk about the future. But I want to go into the Wayback Machine, maybe not as far back as meat slicing for IBM. But at least let's how did you get into this? Tell us a little bit about your background and particularly those those moments. Let's leave a, a trail of cookies to talk about what you've learned from the past and where you're going in the future as we go along here, I think that's the trajectory of the storyline of, you know, where are we going in this market and, and how are we prepared? What have you learned that's going to help us? I mean, I'm assuming that you're going to save us all. You're the president of IBM, for God's sake. <laughs> yeah, I'm saving the world. Yes, I'll get to that. It's all quantum <laughs> no and blockchain. No pressure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Blockchain and IoT, it's all good. Yeah, there you go. It's going to, yeah, I'll throw a few buzzwords out and we'll be all be fine. Perfect. Um, so, yeah, so, so uh, I uh, got a degree in computer science and economics from Rice University. You know, I thought at the time, uh, I, I laugh now when I say this, I thought I was going to be CEO of a technology company. And then I completely took a U-turn. I had no idea what I wanted to do when I graduated. And I just started shoving resumes into folders. This was 1989 before it was all electronic and just interviewed. And the person I clicked the best with was uh, the person interviewing uh, at Rice from the Boston Consulting Group, so BCG. And their Chicago office. So I'm from Columbus, Georgia. I went to school in Houston, Texas. Uh, I'd barely ever seen snow. And uh, so I take a job for BCG in Chicago. And you can imagine the type of clients around Chicago, much more kind of industrial oriented, a fair amount of consumer products. So I did almost no tech, uh, did a bunch of other things, but loved it. it um, they sent me back to business school. So I went to HBS, came back to BCG and thought I would never leave. And I don't think I would have. I stayed. I was a partner there. I did move back to the Atlanta office soon after BCG opened Atlanta office. My biggest client was Delta Airlines. And literally at noon on 9-11, the CEO calls me and said, I need you right now. So I became treasurer of Delta Airlines at noon on 9-11. <laughs> and wow. it was a little bit, you know, they desperately needed me. I, I mean, they were a big client, so I knew them. I was actually there that day. And so ultimately made it official a couple months later, but literally I like took the dust cover off the treasurer's desk because it was an open position there and started thinking about how we were going to not go bankrupt. And so uh, otherwise, I don't think I would have left. I will say one of the things I look back on 
now, both I thought it was endearing at the time, but I realized it d- did affect my leadership style, what we did at Red Hat and what we're trying to do at IBM, which was, uh, I'll never forget back then, before all of the computer upgrade systems, when you were flying, you know, if you had enough status, you could upgrade, but it happened at the gate and you'd have these little right. stickers. And there was a cultural thing at BCG where you would go, you know, fly to a client, you'd see a client, you'd get to the airport, you'd all be getting out of a taxi. And then it is a mad dash to the gate because whoever got to the gate first was going to get the upgrade. And it didn't matter whether it was the senior partner or the first year associate out of college, whoever got there first got the upgrade. And it was kind of one of those things that BCG tried to really kind of create an environment. And of course, this is the first place I'd ever worked. So I didn't realize things could be different. And so uh, certainly kind of colored my early days, the importance of kind of really hearty debate and trying to break down the, uh, trappings of authority that can can slow that down of course i get to delta which was the exact opposite in a great way Delta's a wonderful company but you know airlines grew out of uh military culture right so so many people are military and literally i drive on campus at delta and the, at the front gate they would salute when i drove on so you know very 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 uh different world but an extraordinary experience in a different way can we reinstitute that salute thing? I like that. It was pretty cool. I wonder if they, I don't know if they <laughs> still do it at Delta, but I mean, that was in, you know, 2001 all the way through. Yeah. So it was, uh, I will say there's something kind of nice about that. But at the same time, we talked a lot about Delta that we were way too nice. And one of the things that we tried to break through was to kind of drive a little bit more, you know, kind of confrontational is too strong a word, but a a much more straightforward, more candor in our discussions to make sure that we talked about the hard issues. So that was actually an interesting cultural challenge there. But Delta was a great experience. So I started off at running treasury and business development. I was promoted a couple of times, ultimately was COO, which had almost everything reported. So, you know, marketing, sales, network, all the, everything pretty much reported to me. Um, I look back on it, I was kind of crazy. I was 35 years old when they promoted me to that role and basically put together the bankruptcy plan and execute, executed it through the bankruptcy. Came out the other side and, you know, not to get into the details of bankruptcy, but, you know, a new board was formed and the new board, you know, I think reasonably so wanted to choose their own CEO. And so chose a a someone external, Richard Anderson, who I have a lot of respect for. I knew him from back in the days when he was at Northwest, but, you know, he couldn't have one report. So we basically parted ways very politely. And honestly, I had no idea what I was going to do next. But while I was at uh, Delta, I was trying to do analysis myself on nights and weekends on the network. And there's this massive amount of data that you can download because airlines still have this kind of holdover regulatory filing requirements from back when airlines were regulated. So every 10th ticket is sampled and sent to the U.S. government that then puts that out in electronic form. So I would download all this data because the nice part about that data is you're in granular ticket data and you can see a lot of behaviors around it. But the, sorry to get off on the technicals, but this doesn't matter here in a second. The, the problem was to have a year's worth of that ticket tear data that you could then do pulls from was more than four gigabytes. And for those those of us who are older in technology will remember the FAT file system had a four uh, uh, gigabyte file size limit. And so it was too big for that. Well, that wasn't true with EXT, with uh, uh, EXT2 file system at the time with uh, Linux. So I started using Linux to be able to do analysis on the data because I could actually have a bigger file size to do the stuff I wanted. And, you know, I had a degree in computer science, even though I hadn't really used it through my career, I was still pretty techy. And so after I left Delta, you know, mainly getting calls from larger, more industrial kind of companies. And I get this call about Red Hat. And I remember the recruiter saying, you probably never heard of this company. It's called Red Hat. I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm using Fedora at home, which Fedora is a free version of Red Hat Linux. So it just kind of clicked. I met, came and met the CEO who was looking to retire, and it just kind of clicked. And so that's how I ultimately ended up at Red Hat. And I do think part of it was, hey, I kind of new technology. But you know, when you're in the airline industry, there are a lot of wonderful things about the, the, the large network carriers, and they connect the world and all those things. But I have to say, part of you is also jealous 
of you know the Southwest and the JetBlue, the simple business models coming in with a very just different way to operate and taking share and being kind of the upstart. And you know the amazing thing about Red Hat, and this is going back, I mean, Red Hat pioneered it, but even when I joined at the very end of 2007, we were building a new business model. As we talked about it a lot at the time, it's transforming the way technology is you know, built and consumed. So open source on the way you build the technology, and then you got to create a new business model because you can't sell a license if you don't have a license. And so changing the whole way it's consumed. And so it was really fun to all of a sudden go from being part of kind of the establishment, defending against attackers in the airline business to uh, being at Red Hat, where all of a sudden we got to be the attacker. And there's something magical about that, both in the sense of it's kind of fun to attack, but you also, your ability to pivot because of size and you know, you're not as entrenched in one way of doing things. Uh, it was really an extraordinary experience. And so did came joined. We at the time were kind of fighting it out with a company called SUSE Linux, which still exists. And Oracle had just launched a Linux. But over the next few years, and we can kind of get into that if that's ultimately helpful, we consolidated a position as kind of the lead in Linux. You know, I think people would articulate, we're kind of like the Kleenex brand of Linux. When you think of Linux, you think of Red Hat. Right. Uh, and then from that, we then made the big leap to being a multi-product company with JBoss and the things we did there. And more recently, which got IBM interested, was the kind of move to this cloud native infrastructure. So we were an early, early adopter committer to uh, investor around uh, cloud native Kubernetes containers. You know, all that's Linux oriented. I mean, containers are a Linux construct. I know Microsoft ultimately ported the same construct to Windows, but it's mainly been a Linux thing. So we were in a pole position there. So building out, I think, a leading position around kind of cloud native infrastructure Things were going great. The only issue, though, is with the birth of public clouds, who are very big partners, because the whole idea is we built this infrastructure that could run, you know, bare metal, it could run on VMware, it could run on any of the clouds, which is a great, I think, platform. You know, the big public cloud providers had so much more scale and ability to invest in the services that need to sit on top, which then have kind of value to kind of reinforce the platform that we started thinking, wow, It'd be nice to be part of a company that was bigger, that had more both sales reach as well as ability to kind of invest on top of the platform. And that's, you know, ironically, right around then or serendipitously, I guess you'd say, uh, Jenny called and said, hey, we'd really be interested. So, you know, there was a, a clear strategic fit there. We had been thinking about the problem of scale, but we didn't want to join a cloud company that had a single cloud because our whole model was hybrid, a horizontal. How do we cut across platforms? So that was the beauty of Red Hat Linux, right? Yeah, you know, we'd go in and sell Red Hat Linux. I know you were at Sun, so sorry about that. We replaced a lot of <laughs> Solaris. And, That's right. um, but, you know, people, we would go in there and we would sell based on, you know, cost a lot of times, x86 running Linux. But what we found over time is the real value came from when you separated the application from the infrastructure, it allowed so much more flexibility over time for enterprises, which ultimately led to a faster pace of innovation. So we were then, and we completely believe now, and so does IBM, um, believe that having a horizontal infrastructure just allows people to innovate faster. Having that choice, that flexibility over time and then with an unknown future is critical. And so we just thought by ourselves, it was going to be hard for us to land the platform to be the realm of the container world. We needed a bigger partner and IBM came along, also shared that vision of this thing's got to run everywhere. And so ultimately, that's how we got to uh, the acquisition. And then I did that for about nine months running Red Hat as an independent unit of IBM. Uh, Red Hat's still independent, but uh, the board asked me to move to be president of IBM. And so uh, I moved to that role in April. And now Red Hat CEO is was kind of my number two, who's now running Red Hat and it kind of remains independent. And therefore, I have a whole new set of challenges to think about as we think about IBM and strategy and what we're doing going forward. Yeah. Okay. So we've got a lot to unpick here. My background is in data. So you're you're singing my song, 
decoupling application from infrastructure and for me, decoupling data and human motion and, and process and procedure. So let's sort of get into this. I think there's a couple of things that are really interesting to the smarter market audience. And there's there's some folks that I think they'll make reappearances. Like not everyone knows who Ginny is and can like pick up the phone and call her Ginny. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll get into that. Should I read that. out her cell phone number in the podcast? Probably oh. not good to dox the listeners, Jim. Right. You know, this is why I, I Christina Peters is your chief privacy officer. I will call her out. You should go call her up. She's wonderful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've known her for a lot of years. So, so let's get into this. I think there's a couple threads here that I find really interesting about not just where you are, but also where you're going. Because when and you're talking about Boston Consulting Group as a CS major. You're going in with at least a bent and an interest and some acuity in technology, and you're applying that to business. And then obviously Harvard, you know, a couple people have heard of the Harvard Business School here, here and there. Tell us about that combination of the technical, the business, and then we'll get into the culture. Yeah, well, that's been one of the amazing kind of things that I've been able to see or the phenomenon I've been able to watch and hopefully impact or at least leverage a little bit in my career is that there was a period of time with technology, I'll call that the 70s, 80s, 90s, where people were saying, oh, I'm going to go automate things using technology. So I'm going to take what I do and automate it, or even the big, there's that re-engineering boom of the 1990s, which is, well, let me go rethink my processes in the context of technology. And all that's really interesting and valuable. And I think it really culminated, I think it was early 2000 when Nicholas Carr wrote his famous HBR article, uh, you know, IT doesn't matter, it's not about competitive advantage. And at the time that was true. But a whole set of both sustaining technologies, you know, sort of internet big in a big way, but whole set of other technologies culminating now with cloud, all of, all of a sudden, allowed technology to move from really helping drive efficiency in the back office to being able to really trans either create new businesses or transform businesses in a really fundamental way. And so now I know it's kind of almost trite now to say, well, every business is a technology business. But I would say even going back to my time at, at Delta, it was the early days of where we said, we're going to be able to fundamentally do whole new things we can engage with our customer in new ways. We can create new advantage strategies using technology. So I think starting in that early 2000s was the time when we kind of, kind of first got to the point where we'd say, hey, having technology acumen combined with the ability to, to understand or think about business strategy, being able to bring those together, I think has become really, really impactful. You know, in Delta, we did a, kind of a, a number of things even then with technology. And you know, we're the, the first people to put up those, they're everywhere now, those 42 inch monitors that are at the airport that have all the information on it. That sounds really nice. That actually came out of, a, hey, if we can, you know, what does it take to go from having two gate agents to one gate agent to board a narrow body flight. And if you actually, you know, had people with clipboards at the time, you know, this is all before the iPhone yep. even existed, much less the iPad, yep. you know, writing down, well, what has a gate agent spend their time doing? And what you found out very quickly, it was things like, where's the plane coming from? Is it gonna be on time? What's the weather like where I'm going? You know, where's my seat? Are there any seats? Can I change seats? And so what we did is we looked at all of that and said, wow, 90% of those questions we can have just scrolling on a screen. And yeah, it's very convenient for people because at the time you didn't have phones to be able, smartphones didn't exist to be able to get the information. So, but if we had that up there, we didn't need two gate agents until literally boarding. And so you think about it, there's like an hour and a half when a plane's you know sitting there, people are starting to come together. If you could have one gate agent there for all except for the boarding where you kind of wanted to at the time to tear paper tickets, you could save a ton of money and also make your customers really happy. And so whether it was that or really starting to think about how we could use the website to sell tickets which uh, in foreign countries, which allowed us to enter markets faster, you know, and, and prioritizing, oh, we'd have to be able to t take credit cards in, you know, 130 countries. And if we can do that, and we can do that faster, we can launch international service faster. And we wanted this big international expansion. So there are a lot of times where 
understanding kind of technology and kind of the strategy and the business coming together could matter. And I literally think that's only been a phenomenon over the last 15 years. Even though technology has been around a long time, it was in the back office, it's now in the front office. I think everybody knows that now, uh, but it's been fascinating to kind of get to have the prime of my career at least be through that period of time. Yeah, it's so interesting to me. And and so we've we've been living parallel lives, mine, mine much smaller. But uh, my dad actually did all of the identity management implementation at Delta, probably oh, in the wow. days when you were doing that. And I was just starting out as an intellectual property lawyer and a, and a privacy lawyer. And so he and I, it, you know, it's the basis of a book we wrote together called The Privacy Engineer's Manifesto. And it really was this basis of how do processing efficiency models meet with customer service and care, meet with data layers. So, you know, IBM's acquisition of the weather channel. What, you know, does IBM want to own the weather? No, but the weather is the the taste maker and the choice maker of so many industrial supply chains, mood, character, personality, type of food that you're going to be consuming. So many things are this data element that seems quite innocuous. But what it sounds like is you've been joining these stacks of let's satisfy the customer, let's pay less money for stuff that just annoys people and and slows them down, and, and leveraging technology with kind of a little T instead of a big T. I feel like a lot of us in, in the tech world, we're doing me too technology. You know, your competitor had a mainframe. I got to get a mainframe. I'm not really sure what I'm going to do beyond spreadsheets, but I'm going to have a mainframe. And now you're talking about what are my business needs? What are my requirements? Who are my customers? How do I serve them better with data? Yeah, and I'll tell you, one of the things I've found really fascinating about being a part of IBM. So, yeah, I joined officially uh, in April of last year. So I've been officially employed, I guess, about you know nine, 10 months now. In the and middle of a pandemic, we need to get to that. In the middle of a pandemic, which is a little <laughs> bit crazy. Yeah. But an observation to me of IBM, which has made it so fascinating is most companies are defined around a product or a service or a set collection of products and services they offer. And they look and say, well, how can we go apply that? And I would say that was true of, of Red Hat, right? Open source software company. We look for use cases and etc. You know, IBM has been around for over 100 years. And one of the reasons is it really starts off with a very, I would argue, simple premise. We don't quite, I articulate it this way. I, I don't, it's not part of our mission, but it's how do we translate technology into impact in the enterprise? And we're willing to fundamentally change who we are and what we do. So I mean, if you go back 30 years ago, you know, we were in networking. We were in all kinds of things that we kind of sold off. And, you know, the simple way I would say, getting to your point, but kind of going back just one generation, I won't go all the way through. In the 90s and the early 2000s, if you thought about the technology context at the time, to simplify it a little bit, it was client server on the hardware side and best of breed applications on the functionality side. And the problem with that is you had, therefore, heterogeneity of hardware and heterogeneity of software. And you had to plug all that together to ultimately be able to implement like an ERP system. So on the technology side, IBM built this, well, it's the largest middleware portfolio, the whole web sphere you know, portfolio to be able to plug all of that stuff together and then built this big services organization to be able to implement it. And then back to the whole Nicholas Carr, IT doesn't matter because it wasn't perceived to be a part of competitive advantage. A lot of CEOs wanted to hand the keys to somebody to run it. So we built this big managed outsourcing business to say, we will build it for you. We'll kind of handle all the complexity for you hand us the keys, we'll run it for you, and you'll just get an outcome. Well, if we roll forward to where we are today, everybody's trying to eradicate heterogeneity or complexity out of the data center. The whole point is, how do I have a homogenous cloud-like infrastructure where whatever's underneath doesn't matter because it's been kind of commoditized and abstracted? And it's all about, how do I accelerate the pace of innovation? Now, combined with that is an explosion of sources of innovation. So it's no longer three or four people in any given category of software that are IT vendors. You still have IT vendors. You have a massively greater startup community because there's so much money floating around in VC. 
You have open source, which has exploded in many, many ways. Uh, you have software as a service is a whole different kind of model and set of vendors. And you have cloud providers that are exposing real fa fantastic functionality via APIs as services. So all of a sudden you say, I uh, have this homogenous infrastructure that I'm going to consume innovation that can come from myriad different places. And I got to do all of that and drive it to kind of then build new innovation myself as an enterprise. And on the enterprise side, it's core to strategic competitive advantage, right? I mean, every CEO cares about this. I'm amazed how many CEOs know, well, at least they can say the word Kubernetes. I mean, come <laughs> exactly. on. It's amazing. Seriously, CEOs. It's so, amazing. And so all of a sudden on the interface with enterprise side, it's no longer about we'll do it for you. It's we'll do it with you. We'll co-create. We'll partner. And so, you know, a lot of the journey that IBM's going through around, you know, the spinoff of the managed service business or the acquisition of Red Hat, you know, it, it really does come back to that. We're not going to do everything anymore. We're not a solution provider, holistic, full solution, but we have to have this hybrid cloud platform so an enterprise can consume innovation from wherever they want it, right? And then we have to retool our go-to-market. We've been in a big process of doing that to say, okay, how do we have a much more collaborative approach to work with our clients? And so I will say, willing to buy businesses like Red Hat, willing to spin businesses off, all to configure ourselves for what we see as this generation of problem. And th that is what we're seeing is if you're, if the point of technology is not as much around automating rote tasks, it's more about innovation and you're going to source components of that innovation from so many places. How do you think about that architecture? And so that's where we've been going and what we're trying to deliver. And that gets into data and how you're taking out your virtualizing data away from applications. It's where and how it resides. All that set of problems are, are areas where we're focused. Yeah. So, so let me ask you this. And well, there's a couple things. Okay. Let's start with you're IBM. You're the white shirt, blue sh suit. I've got a binder. If you've got a problem company, tell us how you've made the leap into this new, cooler, interoperable. We're no more. It, it's no more about just government sales and outsource Palooza, as you've said. It's really understanding how do we meet the business strategy of tomorrow. How how does IBM now sort of redress itself as you know it was one of the first, if not the first cloud provider. You know, this is back in the days we were buying tiny little companies called Gridware and calling it the utility grid and all this other stuff. And IBM was one of the few people that I could talk to back in those days of early cloud, you know, but AWS served SMB and, and they ate all of our lunches and then they ate our dinners and our breakfast too. So now here we are in a, in a world where IBM stands for great engineering in my mind, what does that mean? How do you retake the field in in cloud to be cool? Or do you? Is this a new way of looking at where you're going with IBM? So I got to tell you one story really quickly that I promise I'll directly answer your question. Back to the straight-laced IBM. So right after the deal closed, which was in mid-July of, of 2019, the, Jenny invited me to have lunch with the board. And so, you know, I come up to Armok and I'm like, okay, board of directors. So I have on like a blue suit and a red tie. No sweat. It's the board and, of IBM and it's Ginny who I, I've shaken her hand once and been like, madam. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I, I like walk into the room and everybody falls out laughing because none of them are in suits. And then I'll hear, and I, 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 Ginny actually said, she's like, what is that like your dad's like funeral suit or something? It's like, <laughs> like no, it's a big deal. <laughs> so I think people had that, and honestly, I had a bit of that um, uh, impression of IBM. And I remember my very early days at Red Hat. You know, IBM was a big partner. They'd said they're going to spend a billion dollars on on Linux way back in the day. I used to go see Steve Mills and these wood paneled offices and all of that. You know. It's nothing like that now, right? I mean, I think Jenny spent a decade trying to really work to kind of change the culture. So all of that piece of it is really, really different. And that's been really gratifying. It's a whole different place, I think most people remember. Uh, and so I've, I've felt very much at home on that piece. Related to how we think about the market, I do think that one of the things that's a key lesson for all of us to, to, to recognize is 
what I'll say, user-driven innovation is extraordinarily powerful. And so people like Amazon, really good at running e-commerce and websites and all of that. So guess what? They have extraordinary technologies to be able to do that. And they've done a great job of expanding beyond that. And they're big partners with Red Hat and now IBM. So I have a lot of respect for what they have done and are doing. But there's a whole set of workloads where I would argue it's crazy to try to compete with uh, someone like Amazon or like Google right around in areas adjacent to their wheelhouse. Now, that said, none of them run the world's largest, you know, financial systems and these other, you know, mission critical transaction based workloads that currently run in and around the mainframe that we've been doing for a long, long time or the, you know, the power systems, the Unix is that the workloads that are there because of a set of characteristics, either it's a set of performance characteristics or the nature of the workloads themselves. And I'm not trying to defend those things. We're making changes and evolving. But in the same way, Amazon around a set of, of web-based workloads, they're a logical place to go run web-based workloads. If you're in financial services and you are regulated and you got to show up at regulators and talk about your 500 controls and your control framework around that, we are your best partner to do those types of things. So as we thought about this hybrid cloud, the first thing that we have recognized, and that was part of the acquisition of Red Hat is, people have websites they're gonna to wanna to run. And you know what? Amazon's really good at that. <laughs> I'm picking on them in particular, or some certain type of data things where Google's really, really good. But if you wanna have one common environment or a few, very few common envir uh, environments, if you want to have one common security model, if you ever want to think about, hey, I love this algorithm today on Google, but what if there's a new one on Amazon next month and I may want to avail myself of that and data has gravity and having a common architecture makes a lot of sense. So what we've basically done is said, how can we have an architecture that runs from the mainframe to power to any major cloud provider, runs uh, NVIDIA GPUs, runs on ARM, so you can run it all the way out to the edge. Um, that has a lot of value, both in the sense of it makes the your ability to run a hybrid environment much less costly and much more secure in a whole bunch of regards. And for our own public cloud, our ability to take the capabilities we have, especially around regulated industries, but also around workloads that have a set of performance characteristics, especially around transaction processing, we're the best there is there. And so, you know, our ability to kind of in the same way, take those adjacent sets of workloads, we feel really good about. And I think we're demonstrating that with a lot of clients now and, and making a, a lot of progress. You know, those aren't the workloads people want to go and scream loud about, about your you know new website, <laughs> But those are big, important workloads and frankly, higher priced and higher margin. So it's a, a place exactly. where it makes sense for IBM the same way, you know, we're, we are deeply involved in compute, but over time we shed the, you know, x86 server business, right? We're deeply involved in cloud and we can certainly run hyperscale workloads. So I don't want to say we can't, we do that a lot for clients, but, you know, I think our real competitive differentiation is around regulated workloads and areas like that. So that's our focus is both hybrid because if you don't have an architecture like that, you're never going to be able to innovate as fast as you want. And then particularly in our workloads, thinking about ones that are more similar to kind of areas that you would expect IBM to be strong around, you know, mainframe, mission critical, uh, hyper secure. Yeah, so I'm I'm getting goosebumps, and I, and I know that you know a lot of people do blow smoke at you. I'm gonna blow a little smoke at you, Jim, uh, because I think starting out in Boston Consulting, you're you're talking about business strategy. What do people need? And then you're moving into you know something that grew out of the military. I mean, flying planes and landing planes successfully is a, a work of art and a work of physics and a work of diplomacy, right? It's like everyone has to be in synergy and working. It's a system. And it's a it's a soft system with carbon based units as well as the hardware. But I think that militaristic background of sometimes there are checklists, sometimes there are binders, sometimes there are things that one does is a really interesting sort of thread running through this again is we're talking about meeting new new workloads and then assigning value and assigning the correct tool 
based on the gravity of the workload, which kind of goes back to that Boston consulting group sort of gene pool in you uh, that I'm hearing is there's a question in here and an, and an, oh my gosh, Jim is amazing. Wow. Blowing smoke thing in here, both together. But I'll say, I, I think the question in it is we're talking about data loads, data gravity, and CEOs and leaders in particular assigning value to the workload, yes, but also the outcome of that workload. How do you see those sorts of metrics rolling up into the average boardroom? I mean, for IBM, you can talk about meeting the, the compute needs, the big deals with the Bank of America and, and so on as sort of proof points. But if, if I'm running a CPG or I'm running a, a hospitality business or, you know, if there are such things <laughs> next year as we knock on wood and get out of this pandemic, how do I actually look at those data priorities? How would you report those things to a, either an ESG committee um, beyond governance, beyond compliance, which we all have to do? Where do you see that leadership coming from and how do I know I'm doing it? The analogy I often use for that different types of workloads, and I often use to talk about there's different types of management problems too. There is a, I need to execute this specific known task versus, you know, I need to go create something new. As leadership models are different, that's also true in terms of technology. So the example I always use there is at Delta Airlines, you do not want an agile team experimenting with the safety procedures before your yes. flight, yes. right? Those are locked down, PhDs have studied them for years, and before we make a change, there is a massive amount of research and collaboration with the FAA and the rest of the industry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you want a decent website experience or mobile app experience on Delta.com, you need an agile team and you need people who are experimenting and doing all the things that you expect. And so recognizing there are different problems to be solved and the appropriate way to solve those problems can be different. And we'll talk about that in technology. I talk about this a lot in management as well. So there's a highly directive approach that you need to take for some types of problems. And there is a much kind of softer, more, I would say, how do you seek the optimal or get a team who can seek the optimal and create a context around that for a different set of problems. And that's true whether you're writing code or whether you're the CEO of a business and in a specific type of problems. And that ambidexterity, whether it's in a your dev shop at a company or in your leadership team, I think is critical to success. And the reason I say that is, I think if you went back let's be more extreme, 50 years ago, 90% of creating value was let me uh, generate economies of scale, standardization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And innovation mattered, but I was talking to the CEO, I don't want to quote him because I hadn't asked him, but a very large company you've heard of who said, you know what, we used to execute every decade. And once a decade, we would make some type of innovation. Right. He said, now it's more like every year we have to have some degree of, of innovation while we're executing. And so it's a much more of a balance. And I do think that's true, frankly, most enterprise tech teams and most enterprise leaders is most of us came up in a generation where it was 90-10, where 90% of value creation happened by excellent execution, where we are definitely more in a world where I would say half to two thirds of value creation is coming from enabling teams to innovate or create or do things kind of differently. We're automating a lot of the other pieces. And I think there's just, you know, the pithy example I use on that is, you know, making a car you know, 5% cheaper is a massive and very noble effort. And that's great to do, but we're so far down the scale curves, 5% is hard. Getting a car to be used for 95 minutes a day versus, you know, 90 minutes a day has more value in many, many ways, but that's a innovation. It's, uh, you know, how do you think about information? How do you think about context? So the nature of value creation is changing and therefore how we lead needs to change, how we think about data needs to change. That's been one of the, I think one of the most difficult problems back to your, your question on data that I see out there is, I always say this by the way about open source is if 
a problem is relevant to a web 2.0 company, there's probably some great open source tools out there to help you solve right. the problem right. because user driven innovation, they're big IT users. If it's not relevant to a web 2.0 company, not as much because most large enterprises don't have a whole lot of people involved in open source. We're still trying to convince general counsels that giving away IP can be a good thing, not a bad thing, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, in general. And so, yeah, and so the problem that you see in technology is there are incredible data tools out there coming out of open source, but they're mainly intended for companies that were born and built their IT when we were smart enough to realize you separate the data from the application logic. Yes. <laughs> that sounds obvious now. Most enterprises are in a different world where, you know, it's all tangled together. So, so much of what we are doing is helping people untangle that. And there's really untangling it. You know, ironically, one of the biggest use cases that we are seeing now with we call OpenShift, which is the Red Hat container platform, is it runs on the mainframe now. And so enterprises are saying, oh, well, wait a minute, I have all these Python machine learning algorithms that I've been running on, you know, Amazon on my data, but wait a minute, I can now run them on my mainframe at night because my data is on the mainframe versus yanking my data off, right? Well, the right answer, which is great, happy to help people do that. The right answer is how over time do you re-architect so your data is separate from your application? Yes. And so obviously we're doing a ton of work there, but you also then get the because of the nature of that work, how do you think about data cleaning? How do you think about data governance? It, it, all of those are difficult. And then taking that all the way forward, this has been one of the fun things I'll say, I think I speak for most Red Hat engineers when I say this is, you know, working with IBM to be able to look way far off into the future and execute against it. So, you know, Red Hat, I love Red Hat. I mean, obviously my heart and soul are there with what we accomplished, but we were taking technologies and iterating on them. And, you know, that iterative innovation that we talk about in open source and modularity is extraordinary to drive a pace of innovation. But man, it's really also kind of nice to say something like, wow, we need to think about, you know, bias in our AI systems and be able to put 25 PhDs against yeah. it to think 10 years out, right? And then kind of write against it. And, you know, IBM is one of the few companies that has a research, you know, component left where whether it's, you know, bias in AI or quantum or, you know, quantum safe cryptography. And, you know, we've even had, uh, this has been amazing. We had a couple of big client engagements where they wanted to move applications to uh, from these, you know, on-premise monolithic to, you know, public cloud. And a lot of the same researchers who did what we call project debater within within IBM, which was, you know, the follow on to beating Jeopardy was let's beat a champion debater, which means you need to right. understand context around language. Well, guess what? If you can understand context around human language, you can understand a lot of context around source code. And so yeah. our ability, we take the same engineers <laughs> and technologies and we can apply it to looking at source code to helping migrate those things over. So the, a lot of what we are doing is I think we know where we want to go in the future is how do you get from here to there, given the complexity of where and how the data resides. And then importantly, to your point is as senior leaders of companies, you are going to be held accountable for your actions today based on what we know 10 years from now. And I'm going to use a horrible example because I just can't think of another one on top of my head is, you know, the tobacco industry, you know, when did you know, when did you have a sense, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we all know now, but, you know, 40 years ago, when was the Surgeon General's, you know, report first came out, right? Well, we kind of know there's bias in AI models, and but we don't know enough about it. I think most CEOs wouldn't even know what questions to ask. In five years, some of those CEOs are going to be in front of a Senate, you know, special committee investigating this stuff. And it's like, well, didn't you know there was, vi uh, you know, there was bias? And what you'll probably get is, well, I, I know there was an article in, you know, the Wall Street Journal once. So, yeah, I guess. And then, you know, you're, so we're trying to invest ahead of that and actually and have ways to measure model and model drift and governance around that now. So uh, it is kind of fun to be at a company where we can invest in problems we know are going to exist and kind of work our way back into it. And that's been one of the exciting things. So we have a big effort around anti-bias and AI and how you manage around that. The other one that we do a lot of is auditability. So especially in 
government um, regulated industries like financial services, you know, you can't really, this is overly simplified, but it's basically, so you can't make a loan based on a machine learning algorithm because right. it's not auditable, right? It's a black right. box, right? And so, so, you know, we've invested in all kinds of technologies that allow you to leverage AI to make decisions, but in a way that's auditable also that we can check bias. And so, you know, so there's some amazing technologies that we need to think about as we think about the future, recognizing some of the, the ethical and moral challenges we'll face in the future and already starting on them now, it's been fascinating to be a part of. I love this, and and I'll sort of uh, and we're nearing the top of the hour, so I won't keep you too much longer. Although I could mine your brain for for years, I'm thinking as you're speaking about auditability. I'm also thinking about qubits and quantum and bias and AI. Like, what's your what's your most optimistic technology innovation, and then what's your worst? I would say a technological bad date, which right now I think is quantum and AI in its current state. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you know, I do think that, and one of the things that we're working on uh, right now is is these generative models, where you say I can take all of these AI models that are out there that can identify things quite well. Well, we're now going to say, well, now how can I then start saying asking questions? So I'll take an example. You take hundreds of thousands of different elements and materials and run them through models, know all the characteristics of those models. We can now, especially using the power of quantum, start to go back and say, oh, hey, I'm looking for a material that might, you know, attract carbon out of the atmosphere onto what's a substrate. And rather than trying to figure out what it is, say, hey, I know all these characteristics of all of these, what might a material be that does does that? And that ability not just to do the deductive stuff that we can do now, but the more generative stuff, I think can be incredible. You know, we announced yesterday, I, I got to be the one to announce it because I'm passionate about it. You know, I, IBM going carbon neutral by 2030. But what we said is we're not gonna do that by buying offsets. Right. We're going to get most of the way there, you know, by using less energy and renewable, et cetera. But the rest that we can't, we're going to get there via technology, via, you know, carbon capture, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, we can see a pathway to get there with what we know. And that's really exciting to be a part of this idea that we can start to, we call it, you know, accelerating scientific discovery. And we do think this ability to use technologies to actually do some of the question answering that we would normally hypothesize and have to work our way through and ask computers to support us. We can now have them do that set of work is really, truly exciting. And I think we're convinced we don't, we don't have the answer, but I think we're convinced that we can play a significant part in better batteries, carbon removal, et cetera, using the power of those technologies. I would say the thing that scares me the most right now is way too much data floating around now, even encrypted, and people seem to think that's okay, yeah. combined with the fact that we know in five years quantum computers will be out there. And what I mean by that is, you know, data stolen today that you say, well, that's okay, it's heavily encrypted. If it's not quantum safe encryption, which very little is now out in use, somebody can harvest that and in five years, they're gonna get the data. And people's medical records, people's financial records, you know, in five years, they still have a lot of value when someone might may be able to decrypt them. So thinking ahead of the curve now and recognizing there will be quantum, we have them now, you know, we've all announced roadmaps. They are there. And most of the technologies we use now for encryption will be obsoleted. And it's not a problem when they exist now. It's a problem on the data right now that somebody can take and harvest and warehouse uh, for later use. And that's the thing that probably scares me uh, more than anything else. As a chief privacy officer for over 25 years, I, I thank you for that fear. I share that fear. <laughs> and I think yeah. it's, we've been told in the production model and the efficiency model, more data better. And we're sort of still knuckle dragging our way through this and going more data better. And I think you're absolutely right, is we have to be able to audit it we have to humanize it and understand who belongs to a person. You know, there's a material science thing attracting carbon. There's a, there's a, you know, new skins that are more efficient to cover our airplanes, et cetera. And then there's, what do you know about us and, and how much 
do we know about us? And, and where is the singularity in all of this data going out there? So I think I think it's a, an exciting and brave new world. I'll ask you sort of a, a, a totally off the wall. By, well, on that point, I'll just point out, I, I do think that, you know, I've lived this from the, uh, from the open source world where information by its nature is free, right? In the sense that it's freely, co- it's abundant, I guess I should say not free. It's, it's abundant yeah. and that it's, it's virtually freely copyable. And, you know, people who are generating information content as a business realized that was a bug. And so they kind of created models, patents and copyrights to take something that wasn't scarce and make it scarce. Well, we haven't really yet figured out a public policy answer to all of this information that is out there. Companies, if you can grab it, it's like, well, hey, it's mine. I can grab it. Well, do we need something like the equivalent of copyright or whatever that would be where you say, no, a company, just because you can freely garner it from someone who uh, unbeknownst to them or is giving it to you, does, does that mean you really can have full ownership over that or not? Right. And so this idea of abundance, we solved it in different ways, you know, proprietary software via copyrights and open source via a different set of copyrights that cause them to be open. But how do we solve that for other types of information, especially consumer information where, you know, just because somebody can grab it for free, does that really mean that they uh, are allowed to own it, use it, et cetera? And those are major public policy questions that'll get to the heart of our democracy and our society that we're gonna have to address over the coming decades. Yeah, I love to hear you speaking with such, you know, clarity and facility with these issues because you're absolutely right. And and of course, I have a bias because I came out of IP law. It's my belief PII is a is a flavor. And so we will figure out how to do licensing and limited monopolies, et cetera. But I think it's I think it's really an interesting thing to to understand in the link, especially the whole IBM hundred years of time, you know, in the beginning of IBM's history, women couldn't even vote. <laughs> you know, we're, <laughs> we're talking about so many, you know, amazing, no one had touched their feet on the moon. And, and any listeners to this podcast will understand that people actually did touch the moon. It was not a hoax, um, <laughs> as it turns out. I'll ask you a, a weird off the wall question. Like, you know, you sound like IBM is turning into a B Corp. Could we ever have like a beneficial corporation type of a, a major longtime legacy corporation having metrics at the board level that are B Corp like? Is, is there something beyond our current financial markers that are making our companies great and sustainable? Because I'm, I'm hearing a thread through all of the places where you've lived and worked and your management style and certainly in your book. That I've only been able to take peeks at because I haven't received my copy yet. It's but brilliant. all of this is, um, how do we do this? This idea of the B Corp, I'll be honest, it, it kind of has confused me a little bit. And I think it's really just all about time horizon. Yeah, you know, I think one of the reasons you hear me talking about that and IBM talking about it is we've been around for over 100 years. IBM issued its first climate report in 1970. Yeah. 1970, right? We uh, issued our first kind of environmental report, I think it was in 1990, right? We've had four different carbon goals with this last one getting us to zero. If you're going to live in a society, if you're gonna be a successful business, you have to live in a healthy society and that's healthy in multiple regards. That's whether it's making sure that there are consumers who can afford to live and therefore having a thriving economy, whether that's an environment, So I'm not sure that requires a B Corp. I think that just requires recognizing that if we're building businesses for the long run, that means building them in a healthy context, right? Being a creature in a dying forest doesn't really help the creature. So I think for companies, we all need to have that as a perspective. And I think we should measure it and we should hold ourselves accountable for it. So I think we should be public about those things. And so that's we're trying to be you know, we have been on things like uh, environment and diversity, trying to put out more and more data. And I think if we can put that data out there, I think that consumers will hold us accountable for it in their decisions that they make, which even helps with the short-term numbers, which is uh, helpful uh, as well. But I do think it's more a sense of time horizon versus a confusion around purpose. And I'm not trying to, I know a lot of companies can get so short-term quarterly focused, but I think if you have a board and a leadership team that's thinking about how am I building an institution for the long run, you know, that helps. I will say at Red Hat and, you know, it was there longer. So, yeah, I spent a lot of time talking about if you look at software companies, 
there are not that many software companies that have had multiple serial successes. You know, you get companies that have one success and they bought a bunch of stuff. And yeah. what I said about Red Hat, and IBM's done this, you know, through a couple of series, but for Red Hat is RHEL was awesome, but we need to think really hard about what capabilities are we building in our culture that are going to let us have the next thing, which, you know, the next kind of big one, not to trivialize the other price, you know, open shift. So we were, we, we kind of did that. But I think that started off with a, if we're trying to build an institution that lasts forever, then you start thinking about things like, well, what capability, you know, think less about the product and what capabilities am I building? How do I attract the right people that I can kind of to persist this going forward. And it's hard to do that without starting to think about whether that's environment, whether that's about diversity, you know, kind of all of the core issues that ultimately make up a healthy society in which we can thrive. So I think it's more horizon versus, you know, different objective for the corporation itself. Thank you again, Jim, for a wonderful interview. Continuing our three-part series on privacy, trust, and identity, my guest next week will be Caroline Wong. Chief Strategy Officer at Cobalt IO, a cybersecurity company with a focus on pen testing as a service. Caroline's practical information security knowledge stems from broad experience as a Sigitel consultant, a Symantec product manager, and day-to-day leadership roles at eBay and Zynga. She has been featured as an influencer in the Women in IT Security issue of SC Magazine, named as one of the top 10 women in cloud by Cloud Now, and has received a Women of Influence Award as the One to Watch category from the Executive Women's Forum. I was on the board when she won that, and she totally deserved it. She authored the popular textbook, Security Metrics, A Beginner's Guide, and sits on the Forbes Technology Council and the Center of Ethical Innovation. Listeners, please help us get the word out about Smarter Markets. It's not every day you come across a podcast with guests of the caliber you've heard here on Smarter Markets. And we have a veritable who's who of industry legends lined up for interviews in the coming weeks. I can't wait. Your ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts and other podcast platforms mean the world to us, as does your help in spreading the word about smarter markets via word of mouth. That concludes this week's episode of Smarter Markets. For free episode transcripts, visit smartermarketspod.com. Smarter Markets is 100% listener-driven, so please help more people discover the podcast by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Smarter Markets is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Smarter Markets should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Smarter Markets are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Smarter Markets, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Abex Technologies, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Smarter Markets.